So this is our advanced genealogy. So we have done two workshops already and we will get started. Um, so we are going to be covering how to find Ancestry through the Framingham Public Library website and the basic layout of the site. And in addition, we'll be doing saving information from Ancestry. I will be saying how um, shortly we won't be able to have remote access to Ancestry through libraries' websites. Um, usually it's just through the Framingham Library at a computer in-house that you're able to save information from. But we'll get to that later. We'll do a quick before you begin your genealogy research and a review from our beginners and our expanded genealogy programs. So today's main focus, a lot of people have been asking for adoption records and they had questions on DNA kits and results. And we'll be providing you guys some special links and book recommendations at the end uh, related to those topics. And then we also have a special guest, Ruth Ann from the Framingham History Center who will be presenting after. And we'll just get started. So first off, Finding Ancestry through the Framingham Public Library. This is an online resource that we provide free of charge for everyone. So if you go to our website, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and we'll head over to Ancestry. So if you go to our website, under Find Online, you'll see Research Resources. So once you select that, you'll be clicking on Articles and Databases A through Z. Luckily, Ancestry is, you know, at the beginning, it starts with an A, so you'll just scroll down until we get to it. And if you're doing this from home, you will be asked to type in your library card number, um, so make sure you have that. And then once you're on the site, um, the basic layout is um, here on the front page, we have the census, vitals, military, and immigration. Those are usually the main things that people, while they're beginning genealogy, look for. Um, there are also forums and more lean, uh, learning resources that you guys can access. So I'm going to only be, I'm not going to do a full search because we did cover that in our um, first two programs, but when you click on search, it gives you more options on this right hand side. Then you can type in the information. So that is more of the how to find um, ancestry through our website. Um, so saving the information from the library. So as I mentioned, usually when you're in the library, you are able to save your information, whether you can send it to your email, take screenshots or download to a flash drive. Um, because of the pandemic, um, Ancestry and our online resources, a lot of them have made it so that you can access this through the library's website remotely from home on any device, whether it's an iPad or tablet or a computer, until December of 2021. So that's the end of this year. They may extend it, but we do not know. We'll let you know if we do. Um, so below I have listed some of the ways that you can save it if you want to from home. There's also a wonderful video that Ancestry has made on specifically saving information and documents from your library. So as I mentioned every time before um, our genealogy programs, before you begin searching, um, you really want to write down what are your goals. Really think about what is the purpose. Do you want to know more about one specific family line or are you just interested in everything? Um, another thing is, are other family members helping you? So we'll get more into this later, especially with the adoption section. Um, but the more family that you have helping you, the better it is. They are able to share stories that they might know or over time they might remember things that you know they didn't think of when you first asked them. Uh, research logs. So we have emailed in the past few um, workshops, uh, a lot of handouts that you have access to. Um, we'll be able to share them also as well um, if you are new and you haven't attended the previous workshops. Another thing before you begin is think of everything that you already know about your family. Make sure you write it all down. Um, I know I'm better with writing things down. You can always remember it, but you never know if you might forget it. And then branch out to extended family and find out what they do know. Even if they're not helping you with your ancestry research or your genealogy, they still know information that will be very helpful. And then the last thing is make sure you ask them for rumors, pass down stories and facts because you will get a lot of information that way. Whether it's true or not, doesn't matter. You'll be able to figure that out. So a quick review of what we covered in our beginner's genealogy for those that were not able to attend that one. I do have a link here at the bottom where you can find it on our YouTube page or you can just go to Framingham Public Library under YouTube and then you'll be able to find it under our genealogy playlist. 
Um, so we covered how to use the basic fun functions and searches in Ancestry. I did a few example searches as well, um, how to do record searching and spell checking and name changes. Those are pretty big because oftentimes when someone's translating it from a doc paper document to digital, they might miss a letter or even if it was, you know, you're at immigration port, tell me your name and the person wrote it down wrong. Another is how to start looking for certificates mainly in America or in the state that you're in. We focus most on Massachusetts because a lot of people from this program are in Massachusetts. And then in our expanded genealogy program, we were talking about finding ancestors born in another country and then immigration ports used in America that weren't just Ellis Island. We talked about citizenship, women's genealogy, especially how women's genealogy is not always the easiest thing to find since it's been a male dominated history of recording information. And then how to preserve family history and memories such as photos and VHSs and DVDs and without, um, without ancestry. So how to just save them for your own records. And then below, I also have a, the YouTube link for the expanded genealogy recording. So today we're going to get into adoption. So our expanded genealogy program today is more about the, the trickier topics that most people have asked about. And those were adoption and DNA kits. So for those that don't know about adoption, so formal adoption statues were first appeared in the States in the 19th century. They weren't always formal. Some, you know, were informal, more of the, you know, sweep it under the table. Um, fortunately, that's how a lot of states were. Um, every state has their own laws for that. As we've noticed, you know, also with immigration ports and citizenship, every state has their own level of law. Um, so if you're looking in a certain state, make sure you check you know, that state's website. Um, another thing is whether you're searching for yourself, whether you adopted or on the behalf of someone close to you, whether, you know, it was a grandparent or a cousin, um, I do say please use some emotional awareness as it's a difficult topic for some people. Um, part of the reason why we're covering adoption with DNA tests is because a lot of people have discovered they are not related biologically to the family that they, you know, grew up with through their DNA test results. Um, so some things, for example, if you are working with someone in your family who, you know, is adopted and they need help because you are, you know, working on genealogy, um, some of the things that are most common are using the phrase birth parent or natural parent. Um, birth parent is probably the more appropriate one because it was the person who birthed you versus natural. It kind of gives them more of a I don't want to say seniority, but it gives them more of an emotional attachment than it should. Your natural parents are the ones that, you know, raised you and you grew up to, to know. Another is made an adoption versus gave up a child. Gave up a child sounds very harsh, uh, but made an adoption, that is what took place. And then another thing is that finding the birth family may not be received as equally as how you feel. Um, so, for example, I know someone who they know that they're adopted and they have no feelings at all. They do not want anything to know about this family. They don't even want to know a medical history because it ties them to that family, which can be hard because they found out that they have a rare blood cancer that they would have known about if they had researched their medical history. But um, so everyone has their own feelings of how they feel about this. Some it's more of an extreme like that case. Some of them it's, you know, maybe that family doesn't want to, you know, be with you anymore that, you know, they don't want connections. So it's a very tricky topic to deal with. So always be careful when you're researching that. So another thing on adoption records are the stages that I recommended to go through if you're really interested in getting information and facts are to take a DNA test. That's a really good way to get a lot of information fast. Another is to gather all the information your extended family and friends may know. Um, someone may say casually, oh, it was a closed adoption, and you might not have known that. Um, so you don't know what people know until you ask them. Another is if you happen to know the biological names, enter them into um, sites you know, such as Ancestry. Some of them will have hints or special features that they'll say someone else in a family tree also has that same birth date or the same name and the same location of where they were born, and it gives you kind of hints as they may be connected to you, that may be the same person, no guarantee, but we want you to be aware of that. So those are always nice things to find. They're also nice to find if you're not even doing adoption records. You'll sometimes notice if you've already put in a family tree, whether it's through you know Ancestry or MyHeritage, it'll say, hey, we found other people just like this in another tree. Would you like to check it out? It's always worth it. 
Another is search for adoption records and ancestry if you go under birth, marriage, and death index. And then if you're on the orphanage records, you can look at that through census and voter list, also through ancestry. So if you're using ancestry specifically, I do recommend the birth, marriage, and death index. That's where if there's going to be mentions of adoption records, it's going to be under that category. So another thing is to determine if the adoption was open or closed. Some are more open. I have a cousin and they are very open with the um, adoption relationship and they now know their birth parent and it's a great relationship and they also have their you know adopted family and they're all fantastic but they grew up knowing that it was open um, closed relation uh, closed adoptions are more of you're not allowed visitation rights access to anything nothing they don't want to know anything it's like it says it's closed so once you found what state the adoption place that took place in um, if you're unsure of where that could even be i recommend starting in this state that you grew up. Chances are you were adopted from the state that you came from, uh, that you're, you know, grew up in. So, and also depending on what year or area the birth mother may be from, you can check maternity home records. So, especially back in, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, a lot of um, women, especially if they were teenagers or in their early 20s, were sent to maternity home, homes. And it was kind of a Go there, hide your pregnancy, give birth, adopt it, come home. No one will know that you had a baby. It's unfortunate, but I know a lot of people have probably heard that story before happening in the past. Um, so a lot of local and state historical societies often have archives. And if there was a maternity home in that area or that state, that county or even the city or town, they might preserve them. So it's worth checking there as well. So I provided some really good links here. Um, one of them is from Find My Past and it's how to find adoption records and use them specifically for genealogy research. Um, the other is the Adoptee's Guide to DNA Testing. So this is a fantastic resource if you do plan on choosing the DNA testing route. Um, and then if you're still struggling to find answers, hiring a professional is a great tool to use. Um, it's just they have access to all these you know, sites and databases that you might not be able to have access to. Um, not just with a professional, but sometimes with adoption records, it does cost money, just like when you're getting birth certificates in other countries or even in the States, sometimes they cost fee, they have small fees associated with them. Another thing is if you know it's the Roman Catholic adoption, ask for um, baptism information. So that will be a great resource. Unfortunately, it only really works if, you know, there's a baptism associated with the religion or if you knew it was from a religious family. So we're going to go into DNA testing. Um, so I actually have done uh, my own DNA test. So if you guys have questions at the end, I can always give you from a personal standpoint of what I thought of it. Um, but basic DNA test sites for family trees, um, they estimate the closest relatives who have also had tests done and have also uploaded their results. That is a big thing to keep in mind because some people will upload it and go, where's my cousin? Well, they didn't do a test from the same site. Um, and then they also show you an estimate of ethnicity and then where your ancestors lived. So mtDNA tests trace your mother's ancestral line using DNA. So if I took that, the mtDNA test, it's my mother's mother, mother, mother. If my brother took it, it's still his mother's mother's mother. So no matter if you're a girl or a guy, it's going to be the mother's line. The Y DNA test is used to explore the father's ancestral line. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you're, you know, boy or girl, you know, it's your father's line. So even if, you know, I'm a female, it, it's going through him. Um, so if you are more interested in a certain lineage and you're doing research, those are great ones to, to check out. Another is there are medical DNA tests that can be done um, and they can help you look at medical history and help you understand any risk for genetic diseases. As I mentioned, you know, the person that I know, if they had done that, it would have been great because then they would have been like, oh, there's a, you know, the cancer that runs in our family that I should have been aware of. Um, not always in adoptions are medical histories involved. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Another is say if, you know, both of your parents passed away when you were young and you don't have access to the medical history because you never asked them it's a great way to have that done. If you know you don't have a running list right now of a document of your own family medical history, I recommend asking anyone who's alive in your family to have that. It also is helpful when you go to your annual physical and the doctor goes, what's your family history like? You can just give them the paper. 
Um, so the most popular sites um, through for DNA testing are Ancestry, MyHeritage, 23andMe, and Family Tree DNA. So these are really nice. Um, a great thing is 23andMe and Family Tree DNA both allow you to upload the raw data to Ancestry, MyHeritage, and other websites that are digital family trees. So if you think, oh, I have 23andMe, but I want to use Ancestry, you can upload it through there. Um, it's just a matter of finding the raw data through that website. So once you get your test um, and get your results back, um, and one thing I want to keep in mind that the ethnicity estimates are still a work in progress. Technology and science are always advancing. So as you keep logging back into your account, you're going to be noticing, hey, I was 43% Irish, but now I'm 56. It's always evolving and changing. Um, so it's not it's not always a huge difference. It might just be, you know, 1% here and there. It's not going to say all of a sudden, oh, hey, you're Egyptian by 50%. It's not going to be something massive that just pops up and it's going to be little subtle changes. Uh, most DNA test companies will use regional ethnicity groups that they compare DNA with, along with historical data. This is fantastic because most people go, how come, it, how come they know historically my family lived there? And what a lot of these companies do is they have these groups in, say if it's France, in that region, they'll test their DNA and then they'll really study and focus on the DNA of those people. It might, you know, be 70 people, it might be, you know, a thousand people, but they focus on families and people that have lived there for generations and generations. So it's kind of a, a cool thing that they do. Another thing is they use the DNA samples recovered from archaeologists, and some of these date back to 40,000 years ago. So that's also how they can tell, oh, hey, you share some DNA with this group of people who lived in Scotland that long ago. So that's how, another way how they can use of the general estimate of the ethnicity of where you are from in that area, in that country. Um, a fun fact is a lot of DNA um, sites originally when they started showed all the countries and then if you were Native American they would show America but they would not show America if you're not Native American. So I did mine years and years ago and it did not say I had any you know United States of American right in me. It was all you know Eastern European, Northern European and now that they've updated they've said this you know, person is from the United States, they've been living here. So it's kind of a cool thing that they've now included America as not Native American in that. So another thing is to um, keep in mind, sometimes people get frustrated and they go, I know my family is not from this country or you know, for this ethnicity estimate. And the human history has been very complex and there's a lot of ethnicities mixing and moving, whether it's through migration, war, trade, there's a lot that has happened. So don't be too surprised if you find something that doesn't make sense, especially if you find, I know if there's like two countries and they border each other, your family might be from one area, but it might also show the bordering country and you go, my family's not from that country, but it's because that region has been so close that people could, you know, overlap. And you might not know, you know, 15 generations back, you did have someone from that, you know, area, but it's, it's a work in progress. That's the one thing to keep in mind with these. Um, I don't want to say take them with a grain of salt, but don't take them as a hundred percent factual. They will never change. Don't go in with that, that mindset because it's not going to be helpful. And then another thing related to that is as you move back in time on your family tree, because you don't inherit 100% of the DNA from every single person you're related and descended from, there's going to be a chance that you don't have that DNA. Does it mean you're not related to the person? No, of course you're still related to the person. Of course you're still, you know, you can say, oh yes, you're still Irish. It just, you didn't inherit that, but you do have the family from there. You can still enjoy their you know, the recipes and the culture from there, you are that. It's just sometimes it doesn't get, you know, put down in the generics all the way, at genetics all the way down to you. Um, one good example is that my older brother and my grandfather have um, Middle Eastern heritage. I clearly do not. Um, I did not inherit any of that. Um, but I also have some Swiss in me and only myself, my mother and my grandmother share that. My brothers did not inherit either, um, any of the Swiss. So it is more of a, it's not a perfect 50 from your father, 50 from your mother. It's, that's the best case estimate. 
So some of the pros and cons of DNA testing, because we've all heard that, you know, there's some negatives of the getting your results done. So some of the pros though are learning about your family and the, your heritage and your culture. Again, if you take a medical DNA test, you're learning about possible preventable diseases. A uh, thing that most people don't realize is the FDA is actually working on a plan to make it easier for DNA tests to be approved. So for those that are kind of on the fence, that's a great thing that the, the fact that the FDA is working on. Tests are easy to take. Um, most of them are you just take a cotton swab and just put it in your mouth for a minute and that's it and put it in a tube. So it's not like taking like a blood test or things like that. Another is you may discover living relatives. Um, so I know I personally have connected with people in other countries and we are now email each other and we're Facebook friends. Never would have realized, but they're my fourth cousin, you know, twice removed, but we just talked genealogy. It's convenient that they speak English because um, a lot of Americans probably don't speak more than just English. Um, so it's great that I'm able to communicate with them, um, but I wouldn't have discovered them if it was not for DNA tests. And in return, they were actually able to get me a lot of certificates of births and deaths and marriages from the countries that I can't physically go to or that I have to pay money to. And in return, I can do the same thing for any um, family of them here in America. So it kind of is a great genealogy working relationship. Now, some of the cons, as I mentioned, the results aren't 100% re reliable. They will change now and then just slightly. I do know my grandmother is 100% Irish. Her brother, it says 99% Irish. Doesn't say anything about the other 1%, but it bothers him to no end. We know he's 100% Irish, but it, it's really bothered him that he's not 100%. Um, another is privacy concerns. Um, you have heard about there are um, some companies who maybe they've had whether it's been like a, a hacking into their databases and you know it, it, what to keep in mind is that's happened also um, some banks some other sites personal data breaches it does happen to more than just dna um, companies um, one of the things also is people are worried that when they upload their data is that um, like police or fbi or the cia you know they'll be able to use your dna um, one of the things I like to say to that is if you didn't commit a crime and your DNA is not at that site, so you don't have to worry about the FDA, you know, the FBI, you know, knocking down your door. Um, a great thing is a company that I mentioned later, they actually worked with the um, FBI and they were able to help catch the Golden State Killer. So it, you know, worked in that favor because they were a killer. But if you didn't do a bad crime, then I don't think you have too much to be worried about on that end. Um, the, another con is there isn't much counseling available to handling your results. One of the main things we've always heard is, what do you mean I'm not related to them? Or that person's not related to me. There's not many therapists that are specializing in what happens when you realize, you know, you took a DNA test and that's not the results that you wanted. Um, so it is an emotional thing. So if you have always wondered, oh, I don't really feel like this is my family. You know, be be wary going into that. For me, I, I knew that, you know, I was related to biologically to my parents. I wasn't concerned with any of it. Um, but you still have that what if something shows up that, you know, you're not expecting. Even if it's a medical DNA test and you see something and you go, but that's not running in my family, but it shows up in the test. Just keep that in mind as you go into it. Another are certain tests can be expensive. I know the average one probably is about 60 or $70 just for the ethnicity estimate and then being able to connect it to find out who else is related to you. If you want um, like an mtDNA or the Y-DNA, those are additional costs and different kits. Sometimes you can do bundles. It really just depends on how much information you want at one given time. Usually if you go through the same company, they can keep your DNA up to a certain amount of time. So that way, if you change your mind, they already have technically run the results to get that MT DNA, but they're not giving it to you because you haven't paid for it. So I know when I did mine, I changed my mind three months later and I said, I do want the MT DNA. And they go, great, we already have it for you. Here it is. And I got it instantly. So that was kind of nice that they were able to do that. Another thing is you cannot use results for medical purposes. Um, so if you, you know, where to look at this and say, hey, it says, you know, I took a medical test and it says I'm gluten intolerant. You can't just use that for, you know, all this like celiac disease. Um, you actually have to go to 
a you know in person doctor or hospital and get medically diagnosed that way. It's not a diagnosis. You can just look at these and go, I have a strong chance of this. But unless if you go to your actual doctor and they run the test, that's how you know it's medically accurate. But sometimes it's just nice to know. So some of the main questions um, in the past few programs that people have asked related to DNA for us to answer tonight. Um, one is why is my DNA ethnicity results different from my siblings? So I kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so DNA inheritance is random. Um, at most, you know, you're only going to get half of someone's DNA. So as I mentioned, you know, granted my mom, her father has Middle Eastern and her mom had uh, Swiss. When, by the time it got to me, I have no Middle Eastern, but I have Swiss. So it is random of how, you know, your parents get their DNA, how your siblings, however many you have get theirs, even if it's your cousin and you go, hey, but we have the same, like, they're also French Canadian, but theirs shows this. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's, it's just like, you know, when you got blonde hair or brown eyes and things like that for genetics. Another thing is, can other users on whatever site I use see my DNA results? Unless if you put on your settings and privacy that the public can see your results, then no one can see your results. So there is the privacy in that. If you did want to upload it, say, to Ancestry, there is a way under your settings of what you can share with people, and then it can help you connect and build your family tree through Ancestry and other people who have uploaded their DNA. Um, but like I said, it's all under settings and privacy, and that's all up to you. Another is, what else can I do when I have my DNA test results back? Usually, you know, you get your ethnicity estimate, and then if you uploaded it to Ancestry, it says, you know, here's the 9,000 people related to you um, in some form of other. Um, as I mentioned, so there are some companies like GED Match, and they let you upload the raw data, raw data into their site. And then they offer different comparisons and other information that you wouldn't get from, you know, 23andMe or Family Tree DNA. Um, so one of the fun things is you can actually, if you have, say, if you and your spouse both did a DNA test, you can upload the raw data and then compare the kits, and it will actually tell you if you guys are related somehow. Um, not a good thought to, to think about. Um, I definitely did that with my spouse and we're not related. And I was like, oh, good. But um, there are some people who I know who have done it and they've shared like by marriage a common ancestor. So it's kind of a, a strange thing. It also will do um, things like it can predict, you know, based off the DNA that you have uploaded, it could tell you, oh, you have blue eyes and blonde hair. And you could go, yeah, that's right. Um, and it also lets you compare from different companies. So whether you use Ancestry, 23andMe, FTDNA, um, or MyHeritage, no matter what company you used or anyone else that you know of used, it lets you upload it and compare it to other sites. So if you just did the Ancestry and uploaded through Ancestry, you're limited to just the Ancestry DNA results from other people. But this lets you go through everyone who chooses to upload it so you kind of get more access. So instead of, you know, 9,000 people related to you on Ancestry, it might say, you now have 23,000 people that we can connect you to. And then what do some results look like? So I actually have a few slides here. So this was from Ancestry. Um, so you'll notice it's the uh, ethnicity estimate. So what it does is it breaks it down mainly by country, and then it might do um, a little breakdown. So you'll say it says Indigenous Americas, Mexico, and then it has the little bullet points indented and it breaks it down more per region. Um, so as you select each one, it will break it down. And then it does a really nice color coded map so you can see the general region. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if two countries are really close to each other, such as you know uh, Spain and Portugal, you'll notice that um, if you zoom in closer, you might get a little overlap. Um, another one is here. Um, this is more of Eastern European um, DNA. Um, as you'll notice the breakdown, so it might say 24% and 22, and as you go through, um, there are sometimes you'll see it'll show less than, and it'll say 1% or less than 0.7%. Um, as I said, the sites are always updating because of science. So sometimes if it does say, you know, less than 1%, I don't always recommend saying, hey, yeah, I also have, you know, 
Swedish in me, and it's less than 1%, because that often will fluctuate every time there's an update with the technology used to process your kit. So this is a different site, but I want you to see more of like an inside um, view. So there's three different um, sections that show. One will show a direct match. So this one is a brother match. Uh, it tells you the shared DNA, the shared segments, and the largest segment. And usually you'll find that the, the bigger the number, the percentage of the shared DNA is the closer relative to you. Obviously siblings and parents are gonna be closest. And as you go out, grandparents, cousins, and further will have less and less. It says estimated relationship brother. Um, so if you know that's right, yeah, I'm great. Um, on the second one, it says first cousin twice removed to third cousin once removed. So a good thing to keep in mind is um, when you think of like a chart of how you're related to everyone, first cousin twice removed is enough removed from you where, and it's that, you know, their, their child, but third cousin once removed, you kind of get back into great, great grandparent and then their child. So that is kind of a big range, especially the further you go back because sometimes they you know had more children back then i have one ancestor one great great ancestor who had 12 children so it could be you know any one of those 12 children and however many children they had so that's where you kind of see where it gets tricky um, one of the great things is you can do contact if they have it in their settings that you can contact them um, they can go through the website um, so they can go through Ancestry. It doesn't give you, you know, their personal email. But what you can do is connect with them and say, hey, who do you have of great, 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 great grandparents? And we'll just keep going back until we find the common person and then go backwards down back towards where you and them lie further down on the tree. Um, so you'll notice that shared DNA is 1.4%. So compared with a brother at 39 versus, you know, Front first cousin twice removed, they're probably closer to a third cousin once removed because of it's such a small amount. The last one, location um, where it says locations, it actually shows you on this particular site how many matches of DNA other people have uploaded in that country that share some form of percentage of shared DNA with you. It could even be 0.2%, it could be 40%. But it kind of shows you a nice breakdown of where um, these are from. Usually you'll see these similar numbers reflecting in the percentage. So if we go back here, you know, if you're seeing more in Eastern European and Russia, um, you may see the numbers for Russia be more matches than, say, you know, Germany. So for more information on DNA tests, um, I recommend here, um, there's a lot of good ones if you choose Ancestry because you are now more familiar with it through these um, program workshops. Um, they are all listed. I also do recommend, there's a really nice um, blog post that someone did where they actually took nine different DNA tests through different sites and they compared them all. So if you're hesitating on, hey, I don't know what DNA tests I even want to do or what are the pros and cons of each one, this person breaks it down really nicely. Um, another one is um, more about medical DNA test and how you can tell what's hidden in your genes. And then also how scientists are using um, DNA tests to, to predict the future of what are, you know, whether diseases or what people, you know, will be in the future. Um, and then also don't forget to check the DNA forums. If you go under Ancestry, under message boards, you'll see a lot of um, ones there. Um, also, people underestimate Facebook groups. Sometimes you'll find some really nice ones and more specialized ones of certain countries that you're looking for. And then for more basic information on genealogy research, I recommend here. I also included the United States Adoption Research link. Um, so for those of you that are looking more for adoption, please use that. And then here's some book recommendations. These are all ones that you can find in the Minuteman Network. Um, all the links take you directly to our Minuteman catalog that you can check them out and request. Some of them the Framingham Library does own um, and you can just request them to pick them up here. So um, before I, I pass it off to Ruth Ann from the Framingham History Center, I wanna remind you guys, um, if you are gonna be looking for this on YouTube later on, here's our link to it. And then also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, even though this is the last of our genealogy workshop trilogy. We will be doing more and hopefully in-person workshops in the future and next spring. 
Um, so make sure if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, or Twitter, we will be posting about when the next ones are. So we are going to take it away to um, Ruth Ann. So let me start your presentation. So please take it away. Thank you, Jillian. I enjoyed this very much. Um, I've had some great experiences with my DNA as well and have expanded my family through DNA. So I recommend it highly. Um, anyway, I wanted to tell you, I've been at the Framingham History Center for about 10 years doing research. And I wanted to give you an idea, if you just flip a little bit uh, to the next one, Jillian. Um, so we do our research at the Academy. Um, so you see the building right there. A lot of people think it's going to be the Edgell Library, but it's the Academy. Uh, we are open from 10 to 2 by appointment on Thursdays. And by reaching us at research at framiumhistory.org, or there's a phone number to be called as well. Uh, because I work with Fred Wallace, who's a city historian, it's just about anything that you ask that can be answered generally. Uh, I don't think we've been stumped that I can think of. Uh, so we work hard at trying to get everyone the response they're looking for, the information they're looking for. Um, again, Jillian, if you flip to the next one, I just want to talk about the research policy. Um, if you do independent work, uh, we'll pull a file for you. If you have a business that you want to look into that your grandfather owned and you have something on it, you come in and you work independently. And if you're a member, there's no charge. Uh, there's a five dollar charge otherwise. Um, and then if you have someone work directly with you, uh, you get the first two hours free if you are in fact a member. And then uh, after that, it's uh, I think twenty five dollars an hour. And non-members, um, I think it's twenty minutes, and then you charged after that. So uh, next one, please. I, I wanted to include a few examples because people say, well, what do people ask for? What do they look for? And I don't want to name everything, but a few things that I can mention, you know, uh, a photographer that used to wander up on Wayside Inn Road and found a, a house that was just a shell wanted to find out who owned it because it was an interesting house. It turned out to be made of concrete and it was a very substantial family from Framingham that owned it. And so it was a wonderful research project and he actually did a program on it. So those kind of things happen. We have the Parker House historian who's come out. The Parkers are very prominent here in Framingham. Uh, so. Dr. Pa Peter Parker is prominent. Everyone knows his name, but Harvey is another Parker who owns the Parker house. And he had a, a farm here in Framingham that his brother ran for him. So that was so interesting because the things that we found, even a map, a hand-drawn map on onion paper uh, of the farm. So uh, you never know what we will find. I, I wanted to mention one thing as, uh, you'll see the woman who's attempting to find uh, a, a secret about her great-great-grandmother's death. Um, you know, in her family, it was whispered. She knew something wasn't right, but no one knew what it was. And if I say murder-suicide, you can find out about it. Uh, it's now in uh, a book that's just come out. It's being introduced next month, I think, at the History Center. Murder and Mayhem in Metro West uh, by um, mm -hmm. Jim Parr and Kevin Swope. Um, another thing that I thought is interesting is um, one of the churches locally were going through records. Some of the old churches keep some wonderful records. And they came across Chinese being taught in Framingham. And they called to find out what if we knew the pub, uh, population of, of Chinese at Framingham. And it was surprising. It's, it's a little difficult to identify, but if you go into Ancestry and you just put in Chinese in, into a, a uh, in Framingham, 
into a census, you can pretty much get an idea. And I can tell you, um, you know, we found a number of, of Chinese in Framingham and, and this was before there were restaurants here, uh, there were laundries. And so that was, that's another interesting aspect. Uh, people buy homes that they want to know about, who lived there before them, something they found that was of interest. Um, newspapers in particular that are found in the attic that are dated earlier than the house was supposed to have been built. Um, so we have found, you know, some, you can't necessarily rely on the assessor's map to tell you uh, their database. It can be off. It could say 1947 and we have found it to be maybe 1920. So something like that is also interesting. Um, what else? Uh, African-American jockeys here in Framingham uh, that were at the Maycumber estate. They actually lived in, with John Maycumber and um, ran in the Boston Marathon. So that was another interesting aspect. And I have to mention the Brazilian immigration. Um, we have such a diverse community. And of course, Brazilians, I think, were probably the, the greatest numbers that came but early in the, uh, in the late 1800s, Para Rubber Company was here and all, our, all of their product came from Brazil. So obviously um, I'm sure if you're in a three generational family sitting around a table, they hear about Framingham. And they, we actually hosted, Framingham did, um, a Brazilian Congress delegation that came and we have a picture of it that is fascinating because they're all in tall hats and very stern and stiff standing in front of the power rubber company in the 1800s so um you know we, we are an interesting town and there's a lot to be found and, and if you are interested in it all in the immigration factor uh there will be a program coming out i think in the spring where we're really delving into immigration and into uh, Framingham. So any questions, I'd be happy to help if you have any questions you'd like to answer. Thank you both. Um, yes, please, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to drop them into chat at any time and we'll be reading them out. Um, in the meantime, Jillian, I do have a question for you. Um, when it comes to DNA testing, if you're looking specifically for family overseas, is there one particular company that you recommend working with because they have maybe a, are used more often outside of the US? Um, for DNA tests? Yeah. yeah. Um, It's kind of hard to, to answer. So the the biggest ones with um, family research and DNA tests tend to be Ancestry and 23andMe. Um, I personally use uh, Family Tree DNA um, because based off my research, I felt they were pretty good. But also it's it's important to look at if you're looking at a certain country. So when I did my research, you know, like Years, like a decade ago, um, I felt that for the regions of, you know, Ireland and Sweden that my family is from, that family tree DNA would help get me more results. Um, also, at the time with my heritage, they had an easier transfer of data from um, family tree DNA because they had like a connection. So I didn't have to download all the raw data, wait for all that to download and then upload and then it takes forever. So they've gotten better over the years, but back then it was, uh, oh, we're connected with them at this time. So it, it made it easier. So if you happen to already have a digital family tree, such as Ancestry, sometimes that's the easiest one to to go with, um, but Ancestry and 23andMe tend to be the bigger of the companies. So you'd okay. have better luck with that. Jillian, can I just uh, mention that I've used uh, Living DNA and they were really dedicated to Great Britain and Scotland, Ireland, England. Uh, that was their first uh, 
step into it, but they have expanded now and they are allowing other people to other people's DNAs to be downloaded now as well. Yeah. So I thought that was a good one. I, they've really developed theirs a lot. Yeah, I definitely recommend if you have um, a specific country or region that you know you're probably going to get a lot of results from, definitely find out between some of the ones recommended in the presentation today of, of what might have the, the best results for you. I'm off the top of my head, I don't know which particular countries would be which, which uh, would be best for which um, company. Okay, thank you. Um, and we do have a question right now. Are there any resources at the Birmingham Public Library about Black ancestry, especially prior to the Civil War in the South? And I'll um, say that, Ruth Ann, if you've got any resources at the History Center to share, please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I'll mention, um, I, we did, I think it was the, the first beginner ancestry workshop. Um, a lot of the links provided, there, there were quite a few on researching um, like history in America. Some were prior to the Civil War and some were kind of all encompassing of all parts of history. So not just like the past 50 years, but also the last like 200 years. Um, so I would recommend if you go to our um, the YouTube page and look up the beginner genealogy presentation. The last few slides have links already related to that. Um, but I also know off the top of my head, I think there's a website called Black Past, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and they do a really fantastic job of, um, but there, theirs is more of blog posts and tips instead of more of here's a direct link to find this exact type of certificate. Um, so if you are looking more for that, I definitely recommend checking those um, two out. Great. Ruth Ann, did you have any, um, uh, you know, Framingham well, would have anything? Um, well, I, I, I know we have uh, some things on slavery, which isn't the best part of, of that piece, but um, we've actually done programs and uh, I think you'll find them available on our website. So that might be of interest to someone. Um, we recently had an inquiry from the Washington Post about Dr. Solomon Fuller, who was the first black psychiatrist in the country. And he worked with Dr. Alzheimer. And that's a very interesting piece. His wife was Meta Fuller, who was a sculptress. And, um, you'll recognize many of her sculptures around Boston. And um, they lived in Framingham on Warren Road. And so there's an interesting story to be had too um, that we have the books on their family as well as I think the other one was nine African, no, nine black American doctors, which is very interesting as well. And, and most of them are, a lot of them are from Massachusetts. So, um, but specifically, I can't think of a specific file that we would have um, available. Thank you. Um, again, to the audience, if there are any questions you'd like to ask, please feel free to drop them into chat. Also, if you have any recommendations for what you would like to see continued for genealogy programs at the library, um, we're open to suggestions. As I pointed out, today's topics of adoption and DNA kits were the most suggested ones from the past couple months. So that's why this program was dedicated to it. And we also had quite a few requests on Framingham specific history, um, hence the Framingham History Center being our special guest today. Uh, Jillian, I do have one more other, other question for you. Um, you know, we've we focused a lot on Ancestry.com um, and obviously because the, the library has a subscription, so to speak. Uh, are there other websites similar to this that we could look into? Yeah, um, so there's um, two that I recommend. Um, other than Ancestry, MyHeritage is the also the other big one. Um, usually those two are the, the top two people use one or the other. Um, if I remember incorrectly, I think it's just 
family search. Um, it's one of the links provided in um, in this program that you'll be able to to see on the recording. Um, and they also do their to create a family tree on their site is not as user friendly as Ancestry or MyHeritage, but they have a lot of um, information to help you find different resources and connect with people through forums and message boards. Um, so they're nice as well. But I do recommend MyHeritage and Ancestry as the, the the big ones because chances are a lot of because they're so big, everyone is using those. So it's fantastic. So as I mentioned, my uncle also does um, family research. So he uses one and I use the other and we made each other um, managers. So that way we both can log in without having to pay for the other subscription. So we kind of get to use both at the same time because sometimes he'll find a document that's not on one while I find one that's not on the other. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's always a nice way if you're trying to um, get the best of both worlds. And Jillian, um, I do uh, genealogy at the Callahan Center and I often recommend family search because it's free. So yeah. that is the big really um, thing about it. it. You know, you're paying about $300, I do anyway at Ancestry because I have World and uh, it can get expensive. And uh, so fa family search is the Mormon site and they have the largest database in the world, I think. So um, I wouldn't rely on their trees, but I would definitely rely on their um, items that they have. Uh, the paperwork is, is really very available. Uh, sometimes, yeah, and sometimes you'll find things there that you can't find elsewhere, especially when it comes to out of country. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and we have one more question for you guys. Uh, the question is, I used Ancestry two years ago. Is it too late to ask for why DNA results? Is, is it too late to what? To ask for why DNA oh. results. Oh, um, so I'm not sure on Ancestry's policy for how long they um, keep the information for. That's something you would contact. I want to say two years they should be able to keep it, but that's only speaking from my experience with um, family tree DNA. Um, they everyone has their own policies of you know it's also a privacy concern of how long you keep that information for, how long you keep. The, the sample of the DNA swab for. Um, so it's all different, but I would reach out and ask and say, hey, I you know did this um, test before for this. Do you still have it or do I have to resend a new DNA sample? Sometimes they might just recommend doing the whole new DNA sample because you're still gonna have to pay for the kit, it's the, the results itself. So, and it's not like the swab is going to cost any more or get you a discount. So sometimes it's best just to have like a fresh DNA thing you know, um, but yeah, it just depends on what their privacy policy is for how long they keep their their um, results for. Mm 